Hello there, I'm Callum Johns and welcome to the EU in Review, where I review the Star Wars Expanded Universe as I experience it, which is currently in chronological order as best I know how, and that line is inspired by Matt Wilkins. So, that's for the novels anyway. Today I will be talking about Hard Merchandise by K.W. Yeeta, or Yeeta. And I'll start with reading the blurb as I have for my last few ones. Feared and admired, respected and despised, Boba Fett enjoys a dubious reputation as the galaxy's most successful bounty hunter. Yet even a man like Boba Fett can have one too many enemies. Hard merchandise. When Boba Fett stumbles across evidence implicating Prince Sheezor in the murder of Luke Skywalker's aunt and uncle, Fett makes himself an enemy even he fears, the unknown mastermind behind a monstrous deception who will kill to hide his tracks. Fett also finds himself in possession of an amnesiac young woman named Neela, who may be the key to the mystery, or a decoy leading Fett into a murderous ambush. Fett's last hope is to run through the list of Shizor's hidden enemies, and since Shizor's hidden enemies are almost as legions as Fett's, the chance of survival is slim, even for someone as skilled and relentless as Boba Fett. Awesome. So this is book three, the last of the Bounty Hunter Wars trilogy, which is cool. And yeah, I'll get straight into my thoughts. So the first thing that I took note of is that it's interesting that intoxicants and simulants cause Zuckus to feel melancholic and depressed compared to the highs and the happy drunks of other species. And it's also interesting how Forlom, a droid, Zuckus and Forlom pair, or 4-LOM, makes himself welcome by buying a drink that he can never drink because he's a droid. So that's interesting. It also mentions the event where Zuckus had his lungs burnt from the accidental inhalation of oxygen. And I don't know where that is. If anyone knows, oh, please let me know. Because I'd love to read it. Because this event is mentioned in both his Tales of the Bounty Hunter story and in Hard Merchandise. And they're not written in the novels because I've been reading them chronologically through personally before I started even doing this. Which is why I started the EU in review in the middle sort of in the legions. Anyway. It also mentions that the Rebellion's mission was rescuing Han Solo and the Forlom and Zuckus were actually sent to do that by the Rebellion. And of, of possible futures they attempted to retrieve Han Solo after that Empire Strikes Back mission part and failed and ended up with the Rebels. But the Rebels must have sent them on another attempt where Forlom got damaged and they lost their faith in the idealism in the Rebellion. So I don't think, or he may have set up, but I haven't read yet, that there is no Bounty Hunters Guild under the New Republic that Forlom formed. And there's also an odd word, Bergamask, B-E-R-G-A-M-A-S-Q-U-E, which I'm not sure really what that means, to be honest. And I've tried looking it up, I couldn't find it. Maybe it's a typo of some sort. Anyway, I forget what page it's on now, I didn't note that down for some reason. Anyway, Zuckus is awesome in the present day now section at the start there's definitely character development between the flashback then to the now which is really cool even though it's all a galaxy far away <laughs> Forlom's conversion of a motivator to a blaster power source is an awesome idea so he had they reconfigured his wiring somehow so they can convert a droid motivator into a power pack for a blaster they can use inside somewhere where blasters were prohibited because they had removed the power packs which is really cool there's also 
Uh, Spacey's called the, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Mehingxin. It's M H I N G X I N. And the uh, character that is a Mehingxin is Ian uh, Bim Fig. E O B B I M F I G H. That species gives me the impression of actually looking like Master Splinter from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which I thought was interesting. A giant rat, basically, that walks and talks. Boba Fett does mention a previous over- owner of the Slave One next as well, and that they were a bounty hunter. And it's not the impression I previously got that Cure Drive Yard seemed to rebuild Django Fett Slave One f- to Boba's specifications. Now on page 56, there is a typo. I can just find it. Perhaps he means, perhaps they've forgotten my name was well. And I think she means as well. If you can see here, I'll see if I can look at that. Uh, that's down here. So, that's this line along here as long as the camera picks it up. So, that's cool. I was just working out. Oh, I was going to show that properly. There. So, this does. So, at the start of this book, I was noticing by this point, it does seem to repeat a bit of what's already been t- shown and told in the previous novels, the two, last two ones, but uh, it's a bit like you go from season one of a TV show into season two and they give a recap of season one. So, reading them one after the other, it's a bit like, yeah, yeah, I already know that a bit. So it was noticeable to me, but when they're further apart with release dates of books and things, it probably wasn't as bad. And also, it seems like K.W. Jeter, or Jetta, one, however you pronounce his last name properly, Likes using hydrogen atoms in space as an analogy. He's actually used it multiple times in this trilogy. And I just noticed it enough just reading through to say... Like, hydrogen atoms in space. And he just... It's a good analogy, but he does seem to repeat it a bit. It does mention Slavon getting a complete redesign, which could be what Boba did to his father's ship there. And I think that's most likely. So he redesigned and rebuilt it, basically. Because it says about a lot more advanced technology and everything in The Slave One in this trilogy. Both are talking about the rebels' high morality as well as interesting. So the high morality being the moral high ground. As they still must have built up that reputation even though they had to do things that aren't morally right in some cases. Which... I think seems like the good guy thing to us, but that's interesting. They talk about the recording of the homestead. So there's a recording of the attack on the homestead in Tatooine on Owen and Brew Lars's homestead. And in this, it definitely solidifies that it was not Boba Fett that killed Owen and Brew Lars. It was just Stormtroopers ordered by Darth Vader. This is on page 162 and 163, and the page just the line just runs over both pages. It says, "There were only Imperial Stormtroopers to be observed, going about their lethal business." So no Boba Fett. Oh well, people like that theory, even though it's not right. There's also another bounty hunt. Well, it's called a bounty hunter, but he's named Reed Dupton. And he has an interesting past a bit, but you can read the book to find that out. But I thought that was interesting that he was spreading misinformation campaigns for whoever paid him, which I thought could lead into some of the other explanations that some things may be misinformation and propaganda. But I won't go into that quite now. I found it also interesting that the Kuati dungeons, so the planet Kuat, the Kuati dungeons have candles rather than lumas, which is basically 
light panels. It's lumas. Because you call them different things in Star Wars. And page 182. They miss a word. The sentence goes, but it mean, also means that Mon Mothma is confident that my raggedy, patched together outfit can take of business here. So, of course, they seem to be saying, take care of business. Which is interesting. Because they missed a whole word there for some reason. I also found it quite interesting that Boba Fett found more assemblers. There's a whole planet of them or something and learned from them. And I wish there was more on this species because I looked up on Wikipedia, just looked in the appearance sections and they don't appear in really anything else other than this trilogy. Which is a bit annoying, but... Yeah, I'd love more of that species somewhere. Apparently, we're not going to get that now, but it's great while it lasts. And the resurrection of them from the new tri um, issue is an awesome idea. So, the next part to read out was they make a Frankenstein reference on pages 196 to 197. So, it has, I'll just read it out. As though there had been primitive scientists stitching together a dismembered body, hoping to animate it with lightning pulled down from some planet storm wracked sky. Definitely a Frankenstein reference. And Neela finally remembering the past is cool, because she has a stage where she only really remembers bits and pieces, and then she has a bit of a breakthrough here. How she achieved it was different to what I thought it might be, but it's still really cool. And um, Redupdom ship is called the Venusectrix, which I think is a really cool ship name. The Venusectrix. Mm, nice. I also love how they bring back and connect from the flashbacks Nudru Sulak, which is the hunt saboteur. He basically confounds other bounty hunters. And it's a cool way to connect the flashbacks to the present day parts. On page 248, actually call the, the Battle Destroyer instead of a Star Destroyer, which I thought was a bit odd, but maybe they just had two different names for them. Uh, it's also interesting that Bosk temporarily gave up bounty hunting. And I didn't know that that would happen. It completely threw me off guard that he was actually put in the position where he had to, basically, but he still did it. On page 265, it has a reference to Bosk's Tales of the Bounty Hunter story, where he actually says that, this is his internal thoughts, I even managed to steal the hound's tooth back from Tinian and Chen Lam back, and that took some doing, believe me. Because the hound, he, yeah. The Tales of the Bounty Hunter story sort of leaves on a bit of a cliffhanger, so that covers that little gap, which is cool. It's also interesting, uh, Flying the ship, they run out of power, not fuel. That is an interesting side note. Ah, on t page 291, at the end of this chapter here, it actually gives a. I'll explain afterwards after I read it. The felling stirred beneath Kodir's hands, it could sense its master's tension. So the p master who actually owns the phalanx is Kuat of Kuat, not Cody of Kulvolt, which is one of the other characters in this novel. So they swapped around Kuat with Cody because they done goofed. <laughs> which is a bit funny, really. It also mentions that Imperial ships elsewhere in the galaxy are engaging rebel ships where they can. It definitely adds to the Empire's downfall after Endor and the loss of the strength of the Empire because this actually lines up straight with the end of Return of the Jedi and the Battle of Endor being referenced near the end as a nice point of reference, which is awesome. And yeah, they say that the Imperial ships are engaging rebel ships elsewhere in the galaxy, which lends more weight to the Empire's defeat as well as the Battle of Endor. Neil is full remembering because she was an amnesiac, as it said in the blurb. Neil is full remembering is an awesome climactic moment, and I did it really well. 
And it's also interesting to hear what happened to Black Sun after Shadows of the Empire. They give a little bit of a summary of what's happened to Black Sun after she's all's death. And finally, the climax is great. As I said, it finishes the same time as Return of the Jedi, leaving with that same note of hope running through it, with the promises of more to come for the main constant character, I'll call him Dengar, they focus on as well in this. I see sort of side to Boba Fett and that, but he's the one that mainly... The story sort of conveyed through his eyes, I'll call it amongst others, where they have different perspectives and everything, which is cool. It does leave me wondering what will happen to the Slave One, though. Because last year, at the end of this, the Slave One was in the hands of the Rebel Alliance because Boba Fett left it behind to travel more discreetly in a different ship. You can read it for this. And I would say this is my favourite of the Bounty Hunter Wars trilogy, although I do love conclusions and climaxes and everything coming together. It's brilliant. And, oh, if you forgot what books are in the trilogy, I'll summarise them here. I've just got to grab them quickly. Now first we have the Mandalorian armour. Then we have Slave Ship. And then Hard Merchandise is the third and final book of the trilogy. So, uh, yeah, awesome trilogy. Definitely give it a read. I'd say it's well worth it. If you love Bounty Hunters, you'll love this trilogy. I'll see you next time. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one. See ya.